So welcome to today's video on deep vein thrombosis. Um, so let's go move on to the next slide. So today we'll be talking a bit about what is it, how do we diagnose it, and how do we treat it? So it's quite a common um, condition. So what is it? It's a formation of a blood clot in the deep veins and commonly present in the lower extremities. And in terms of what causes it, it's very easy to remember it through Virchow's triad. So we've got stasis, hypercoagulability, and vessel wall injury. So it's a blood clot in deep veins. So why is the blood clot there in the first place? One reason is the blood could be more coagulable. Um, maybe there is conditions or something that predisposes that patient to have their blood clot more easily. Another reason is endothelial damage. So when your endothelial is damaged, it exposes the vessel wall to collagen, and this activates a lot of the clotting factors in your blood and starts to clot. Another reason is stasis of the venous system. So when your blood is not flowing properly due to poor functioning veins or immobilization, the blood tends to kind of pool and it allows the blood to be more easy to be clotted. So now this can explain a lot of our risk factors for DVTs. So in terms of risk factors, big one is age. If you have a family history of DVTs or pulmonary embolism, and that might indicate us to kind of search for an underlying cause or a condition that might be genetic, predisposing that person to be more um, coagulable. You could have prothrombotic diseases. So if you're having conditions like malignancies, um, nephrotic syndrome, a kidney condition, um, auto autoimmune disorders, or even thrombophilias, this can predispose you to be having more clots. Surgical factors, depending on the surgery and the type of surgery, and also the anesthetics used, so if it's a general anesthetic, they're also shown to be more likely to have DVTs. Immobilization, this is a big one. So when a patient is unable to move due to illness or surgery or travel, and again, this links up, links back to that Virchow's triad of the stasis. Estrogen factors, so pregnancy, um, taking medications that have estrogen in them, so um, the oral contraceptive pill or hormone replacement therapies can predispose you to higher rates of DVTs intravascular devices, and then patient factors. So obesity, smoking, IV drug use, or when you are meant to be on DVT prophylaxis or venous thromboembolism prophylaxis. However, they don't stick to it and there's not adherence and therefore they develop a DVT. So it's really important to go through our anatomy. So on the right, we've got here we've got our deep venous system and we also got our superficial system with our saphenous veins. So the right diagram, right diagram more clearly demonstrates this. So we start off with our common iliac vein and it splits off to our internal and external iliac veins. So let's trace down the external iliac vein. Here we've got the femoral vein and it gives off a branch known as the deep femoral, the profunda femoral. The femoral vein then goes down and becomes your popliteal, art, popliteal vein. Sorry, this is our venous system. And then once it becomes the um, popliteal vein, it can give off an anterior tibial branch, while the rest of it carries down and splits into our femoral vein and our posterior tibial vein. So this should actually branch off a little bit higher than these two branching off. The signs and symptoms. So you've got a clot in the leg, what's going to happen? Your leg's going to be more swollen. Your, le your leg's going to be more warm and red, erythema. You're going to have a, they might have a dull progressive tenderness or pain in their leg. Because our deep now venous system is closed off, a lot of our bloods are now relying on the superficial veins to drain back into the heart. So now you might have distension of superficial veins. Your pulse should be normal because it's affecting your venous system. They might have the presence of fever. So patients might not even have any of these symptoms. They might have one or two of the symptoms or all of them. So it's important to keep a general mind. Special signs. There's a human sign. 
So when you dorsiflex your foot, as shown in the diagram, it can cause pain in the calf. May a sinus compression of the calf causing pain. There's a lot of controversy in a bit in the human sign, whether this is a dangerous sign where it can dislodge a clot into our systemic circulation. Um, so it should be used in caution. There are some studies that show that this doesn't tend to be the case, but it's important to keep this in mind. So there is a signs of pulmonary embolism. So if you do, if the patient is having um, shortness of breath, chest pain or dizziness, we might be concerned whether this deep vein thrombosis is actually dislodged and entered our lung circulation. So it's traveled all the way up into our lungs. Now, here's a very um, extreme version of DVT, phlegmasia cerulea dolens, which is a massive venous thrombosis, and it's, uh, it leads to congestion and cyanosis. So here's how it works. You've got a large thrombosis. Due to this pressure, the um, fluid starts backing up and there becomes edema, fluid into our interstitial spaces. Once we have this fluid and this pressure, it can kind of, it can compress our artery and then lead to acute ischemia, gangrene, and all sorts of other systemic instability. So it's important to um, recognize this and treat this immediately. So in terms of diagnosing it, so first we need to have a, we need to, before having our diagnostic kind of testing, we need to think about how likely is this? We can use our well score, scoring criteria. So they receive a number of points for depending on their risk factors and even taking away points if there's alternative diagnosis that are more likely. And depending on if it's low, moderate or high risk, we can investigate this appropriately. So low would be zero and so on and so on. So when we have a moderate to high risk, would immediately go into an ultrasound. But when we have a low risk, we start off with our D-dimer. So D-dimer is a, a marker in the blood that can indicate and has a high, um, when a D-dimer is negative, we can definitely exclude a DVT. But if it's positive, because it, just because a D-dimer is positive, doesn't mean that DVT is the only likely cause. There's a number of reasons why DVT, D-dimer can be elevated, and therefore it's more of um, a method of ruling DVT out rather than diagnosing it. We can't diagnose DVT based on a D-dimer um, result. So we follow this up with an ultrasound scan. If they have moderate to high risk probability, then there is no, there is no kind of um, idea behind um, chasing a D-dimer because we know that there is already a likelihood of being a DVT. So we'll jump right into that ultrasound. And depending on the result, we can um, treat for DVT. And if it's negative, we can safely exclude this as well, um, depending on the D-dimer. So if it's a negative ultrasound and a negative D-dimer, we can safely exclude it. But if it's a positive D-dimer, we might want to repeat that ultrasound again or even do a different sort of study. So here's more about the investigation. We'd definitely like to get some routine bloods. So a full blood count, a complete metabolic panel, a urea, electrolytes, creatinine, liver function test, and coagulation studies. We'd like to get imaging of an ultrasound. And if the ultrasound is inconclusive or very difficult due to patient factors, such as um, if the leg is really swollen, if the patient has a larger BMI, making ultrasound a more difficult study to perform, we can consider other forms of um, imaging techniques, so venograph, graphy, and so on. If, um, if it's an unprovoked DVT, so if there is no risk factors for that DVT and we don't know why it's occurred, or if there's an unexplained recurrence, or if we're suspecting an underlying cause behind this, we might perform um, a thrombophilia screen and also look for any occult malignancies. So here's an ultrasound scan. So here we've got the 
So what is pulsating? When we think of pulsating, we, we know we're kind of likely that this is going to be our artery. So we're looking at the left popliteal artery and the left popliteal vein. So what's going to be more likely to be compressed usually, an artery or a vein? It's usually going to be a vein. So in this case, the ultrasound, whenever we press an ultrasound, usually the vein compresses first. But in this case, we're applying so much pressure that even the artery has started to um, be compressed, but the vein is quite resistant to compression. And this is a key sign that a DVT is underlying in this um, in the popliteal vein. Furthermore, other ultrasound findings, we could actually see a hypochoic mass that could indicate the DVT, and we can clearly see that, but I, it's pretty hard to visualize in this imaging. So treatment, how do we treat it? In certain circumstances, which is quite uncommon, if it's a distal DVT and it's asymptomatic and, it, and it's assessed and it's unlikely to cause any further complications, we can actually expectantly manage it and with serial venous um, ultrasound with the lower leg and monitor it over the coming weeks to months. But usually we start off with primary treatment. We wanna start with anticoagulation um, for three to six months, usually three months. And then secondary prevention, we might extend this anticoagulation and this will all depend to patient to patient factors and depending on their history. If there's an underlying cause, treat the cause. So we're gonna, so first after diagnosing it, we wanna, our main stage of treatment is gonna be anticoagulation. There's a number of agents. Usually we start off with rivaroxaban or bixaban, um, but these might, these the main contraindication if there's a very poor functioning kidney. So if the creatinine clearance is less than 30, so then would lean towards more with, um, um, heparin and um, vitamin K antagonists like warfarin. The reason why we don't prefer these um, um, agents above is because they usually need um, a, building, um, a building therapy um, to bridge um, until they have therapeutic effect. And also another reason is that um, warfarin requires regular monitoring um, of INR to make sure that it's carefully balanced However, these ones require less strict uh, monitoring. So if there is phlegmasia, cerulea dolens, which is the very severe massive thrombosis um, picture that we saw above um, earlier before, then we would like to surgically um, remove the clot or we can actually direct a catheter and um, thrombolyze it using medications. So if there's a lack of presence of that, then we need to consider long-term anticoagulation as well. So that's for the acute phase and the long-term. So usually it's three months if there's a, um, a provoking factor and now it's removed. However, this might be extended if there is um, an underlying um, malignancy, so sort of cancer-associated thrombosis, or if it's unprovoked and we don't know what's causing it. Now, we can treat it and we can diagnose it, but first we need to prevent this from happening in the first place. So regular factors such as, so general factors like regular exercise, avoiding certain medications, especially if they're already predisposed to getting clots. So we're gonna avoid giving them um, oral contraceptive pills. Maybe we'll find alternative medications for that. We might recommend graduated compression stockings to help pump, um, prevent stasis of that blood in our lower limbs and for tra long, especially for travelers, especially for travelers in planes. Um, and if we find that there is a provoking factor, we might give them pharmacological prophylaxis, especially lower, low molecular weight heparin. So patients in hospitals after surgery, especially like a hip surgery, and they're unable to move and mobilize for the first couple of days to weeks, then would usually consider giving them or most likely consider low molecular weight heparin. Um, intermittent pneumatic compression stocking can also be used um, as a replacement for that. Maybe if there are contraindications for that, or um, there might be a preference for using compression stocking. And it works in a similar way to the graduated stocking, but it actually compresses the um, legs to help um, move the blood. 
and surgical factors. So if there is, if they're post-surgery, we want to get them moving. We want to get them mobilizing and physiotherapy can be very helpful in that. So that concludes the session on um, deep vein thrombosis. Comment down below if you have any other um, ideas on what I should do next. And yeah, I'll see you next session.